Last February, Julia and I were asked to speak to parents on campus for Junior Parents Weekend about our teaching. We knew it was an honor, especially because it is the students who choose the JPW speakers, and their voice matters more to both of us even than our colleagues. <laughs> but we were also nervous, very nervous, very differently nervous. My solution in such circumstances is to try to ignore the imminent event as long as possible and then hope I can wing it successfully. Julia's is the reverse. She worried about it and began to prepare for it. And use all that time none of us ever have at that point in the spring semester and all that energy none of us have by then to make sure she got it right. And she did get it right as usual. Julia called the talk why I love teaching French with ND students, and it was brilliant, of course. Here are the first two reasons she mentioned. Life is more fun and challenging in a foreign language, <laughs> and I get to see aha moments on a regular basis. And then she moved on to the delights of teaching by keeping it lively through interdisciplinary teaching and so on. And the delights of teaching for her became very real to all of us in that space that day. That's Julia's pleasure, her absolute, consistent, profound pleasure in the experience of working with her students, sharing her intellectual life with them, learning from them, respecting them, enjoying watching them grow in a class across a semester through their undergraduate careers. Now, the astute among you, and who among you is not astute, may have noticed that I've been avoiding using Julia's last name. That's because I can never quite decide whether that first vowel is an oo or an ow, douthwaite or douthwaite. But I've also come to realize that the uncertainty speaks of two reactions her students have to Julia the ooh of sheer delight in the fun of working with her, <laughs> and the ow of trying to reach those high standards of engagement, intelligence, scholarship, commitment, imagination, perseverance, and determination that she sets them, and which are the academic code by which she lives her own intellectual life. And if she gets those aha moments from her students, they get the ooh and ow moments, and all three moments, aha, ooh, and ow, go together. <laughs> that Julia cares for <coughs> and about her students is obvious. As her department chair told me, admiringly, not wryly, she will never answer the phone when she's talking with students. And she has no hesitation about walking out of an overrunning cat meeting so as not to be late in getting back to her office for a student appointment. And will others please note that if you try that, your chair will check up whether there really is a student who might be waiting. She makes time for her students, whether after class or in her office or outside the classroom, like the many, many groups of students she took round the powerful Dignity photo exhibit at the SNIT last year, an event to mark Rousseau's tercentenary that she had arranged to have brought to Notre Dame. Of course, some of that caring and a lot of that delight is manifest in her choice of courses to teach. Julia simply enjoys teaching students early in their discovery of French language and culture, just as much as the upper level electives, and she puts as much energy and imagination into those lower level classes. I know, I've read her extraordinarily detailed and enjoyable course outlines, like her CSEM on the French woman, icons and issues, with its three photos on the first page of Joan of Arc, Brigitte Bardot, and Fatou Dion, and its three-page bibliography at the end. Or the course De Perceval au Chaboté, uh, for the monolingual that's from Percival to Puss in Boots, <laughs> which ends up bon courage. Her mm. syllabi speak both of the ou factor and the ow factor, and her expectation of those aha moments. But here is a student describing what Julia's caring for her students really means in detailed practical terms. Towards the end of my junior year fall semester, 
Professor Duthwaite learned that I would likely be unable to complete a French major due to the impossibility of getting credit for a 400-level course of the study abroad program in Angers. Thus, she worked with me and with another student in the same situation to develop an independent study course that would meet these requirements. Well, okay, you may be thinking, so that's not so much, but wait, here's what, how the student goes on. The course entailed original research at an archive in Paris, an intensive reading list, bi-weekly blog posts and Skype sessions, and a lengthy term paper. She was under no obligation to provide such a course. However, she went out of her way to work with us to create the course, to get it approved, to help us focus our research and thinking, and even to bring us to see a relevant play with some of her French colleagues when she visited Paris over spring break. Now, the key in this extraordinary description for me is not that Julia made this happen to help the students, but it's that phrase that she went out of her way to work with us. With us, not for us. For her teaching is always working with, always learning with, always creating with. Her most recent scholarly book details a French novella published in 1790 about an automaton builder called Frankenstein whose machine humans are kindly, not dangerous, welcomed, not feared. Unlike the inventor in Mary Shelley's novel, published 28 years later than the French version, the French story is benign, optimistic, positive. Julia, I think, is an inventor too, someone who creates and helps to fashion students who live up to the excitement and the high, high principles of the life of the mind. She too is benign, positive, optimistic, the creator of a classroom that is exacting and exciting for this inspiring teacher. It's a joy for me to offer this citation of Julia Douthwaite, our winner of the 2013 Reverend Charles E. Sheedy CSC Award for Excellence in Teaching. Julia. Can you hear me? Yes? Thank you very much, Peter. That was too much. <laughs> and uh, as some of you may know, I have felt rather ambivalent about the lead up to this amazing event, especially on this, the last day of class, where I do believe that I am really not that special, that we are all very special, and you all work really hard. And so I bow down to my colleagues and thank you very much for coming on this day when you've worked so hard all semester. Uh, some of what I'm presenting here today are some of the same remarks I presented at Junior Parent Weekend, but with a little bit more depth to show the darker side of uh, <laughs> some of my successes and failures. Because what I didn't mention to the parents was the failures because I decided to take a real upbeat approach for that group. <laughs> but for this group, I thought you might appreciate, well, you understand how it works when you try to really experiment in the classroom. And since I am a full professor and I basically have nothing to lose, I figured I might as well tell you about that. <laughs> so here I am. Okay, why I love teaching. Um, I, again, just like Peter said, I love teaching, and I love teaching French because it's always challenging. Uh, you have to, I'm not French, I'm American. It uh, keeps you on your toes. And I've been this way for years, ever since back in undergraduate days in Pullman, Washington, where I went to Washington State University and I'd be walking around the wheat field swept, <laughs> wind swept campus, trying to name everything I saw in French. And if I couldn't do that, I would go right home and look it up in the dictionary. And this strange ma mania has inhabited me ever since. <laughs> I just want to know how to say everything in French and just more and more and more over the years. And that is what I wish for my students as well. And I think it's just more fun that way. Life is more fun when it's intellectually challenging every day. And you know that you have an alter ego in this other language and that over the time you develop this other life over in France with other friends waiting to see you and knowing your history. And 
if you have a bad moment here, you can always remember that other life that awaits you over there. <laughs> and vice versa. When you go there, you can remember that our, our country has its own issues and they have their issues. So that's something I think really profound for those of us who teach foreign languages understand this and the excitement of being somebody else. And the second thing is the aha moments. This is an example of a homework assignment from an, a person who will remain anonymous in um, French RO FR 30310, not this year though. Um, those of you who are in the audience, this is not you. Um, and she's learning interesting, important things about the difference between uh, pensée à and pensée de, for example, as students will realize. And you can see she's working through a lot of it. It's kind of got a lot of red ink on it. And then this is a, a paper of a fourth year student, and look how beautiful it is. And even, she's even got the Chicago style down. Mm -hmm. And it's just smooth and well-written and a, a joy to read. And to watch the students as they develop from this early phase in a foreign language, so not only expressing themselves, but expressing themselves in a foreign language and getting up to the higher levels of nuance and subtlety in that foreign language, is a, it's a beautiful thing to behold and to be part of. The third part is something of a more uh, philosophical and intellectual nature, uh, because I, I also teach literature and literary history type classes at the upper level. This is an example from ROFR 30710, which is our survey, survey one, where I get to teach uh, medieval literature, um, the story of Percival, which if you don't know, is the story of a young man, a country, kind of a country bumpkin, who leaves home and leaves his mother, much to her regret, and meets some, some knights and becomes a knight. And so I charted it out one time. And so he leaves his home, he leaves his mother, he doesn't turn around when she says goodbye, and he goes off. And it, you can see it, it, comes, it, it forms a circle as he realizes that he wants to see his mother again and tries to get back up to see her and then realizes that it's too late and then goes off on another quest. And the story of Percival learning what it is to be a knight, learning to leave behind the world of women and to embrace the world of men with all that entails, the violence and the, heart the heartbreak, he masters becoming a knight and then he realizes that that's not enough. And he seeks, he goes on to another quest which is itself unending for spiritual fulfillment and spiritual uh, meaning in his life. And so this is a wonderful experience that you go through with the students learning about what does it mean to leave behind the, the, your home and to become an adult. And then once you have mastered those sets of skills, what does it mean to find meaning in life? What does it mean to find a truly a life of significance? And so teaching this book is a, a lovely experience with our young students here. Okay, so now I'm gonna run into some uh, caveats, you know, some experiments that I've tried that have worked and that have not worked. Uh, just for fun. So first of all, uh, we, we faculty members like to, inter we think it's a good idea to incorporate our research in our teaching, don't we? We think that's a good idea. And we think that our students would like to hear about it. And so ever since, <laughs> we like to think so. So since about 1998, I've been self-taught uh, in history. I'm not a history professor. I wasn't a history student, but I, I really love history. So I decided to start learning all about the French Revolution by going to the Museum of the French Revolution in 1998. And then in 2006, I received a grant to start working on a book. So I thought, well, great, I will start using my material and teach classes about the, the revolution, but from a kind of a literary cultural point of view. So this is the first time I tried that. And here I am in the library, Rare Books Room, with our wonderful colleague, Laura Futerer. I highly recommend working with her and looking at beautiful things that we have in the library. So this worked out pretty well. This class was more or less pretty happy with me, um, notably the older students. Um, and so again, so I thought, well, great, let's do that again in 2011. And since things were going so well in Cairo in uh, February of that year, when I was planning my class, I thought, well, great, let's do a video conference with our colleagues at Air the American University of Cairo. I had already been over there when I was in international studies, so I had developed relationships with them and with the professor of political science with whom I had done a video conference beforehand with uh, Montesquieu's Lettre Personne and working with Orientalism and Edward Said, and that went over pretty well. So I thought, well, this will be fun. Since they're living in a revolution, 
why don't we just study revolution together? We are studying the French Revolution, they are living the Arab Spring, how much fun can that be? Well, <laughs> turned out that November 2011 was a rather hot moment in Cairo, as you may recall, where the riot police were on hand and many of the students in the classroom with which we were video conferencing twice, uh, we were supposed to be studying Samuel Moyne's book on utopian and human rights and the Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. Those were the texts that we were supposed to study, but it didn't work out quite as I had planned in this cool and dispassionate academic discourse that we had thought, which leads to my caveat that experimentation can wield pretty disastrous <laughs> results for your evaluations. <laughs> Note that I'm down in the 20 per, bottom 20% of the teachers in fall 2011, Dean McGreevy. And if you would like to revoke the award now, go ahead. So, uh, just thought that you might not like to see this. Also, that my intellectual challenge, I learned this is not a good thing. <laughs> when it's off the charts. This is low, somewhat low, moderate, somewhat high, and mine was like way off the charts. I thought, that's great, but it's not great. <laughs> because it shows that the student, it's too much. Mm -hmm. And so this was an experiment that didn't work out so well. And I do want you to know that after I received these evaluations, I made an appointment with the Canem Center immediately, went over there and started talking about what's wrong with this class and what's wrong with me and why can't I teach better after all these years. And I've done some things differently since then. For one thing, blind submissions. Uh, so that they cannot say that I'm uh, partial to anybody because I don't know who they are when I read their papers. So that's been one good thing. Anyway, but I do want to say that even though it was a failure and it was very upsetting to my students, I still think it was a good thing to do. Um, if I can find the mouse. So this is an article that I wrote on my blog uh, after that event. Actually, I wrote it on Christmas Day of that year, 2011. Oops. Um, so this was the year that the protester was the woman or the person of the year by Times Magazine. And so I was inspired to write this little excerpt here. And I decided I would lay off video conferencing with AUC for a while. Uh, because working with people who are actually going through a revolution and part of the revolution is very different than studying in a classroom. And it was very upsetting to my students. However, I still think it was a good thing to do because now they know what it's like to live in a very stormy political moment. And they know that it's upsetting and that you're not really dealing with rational people because they're, they're very upset. And so even though it was, a, it was not a necessarily a, a successful moment, um, I still think it was a good idea. So I wanted to say that. <laughs> and I would do it again. Okay, whoops, sorry. Um, I guess I'll just have to go forward. Ah. How do you do that? This? Okay. okay, there we are again. All right, so now on a happier note, moving right along, the book was published last year, and so that was good. And so, there we go. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was this interdisciplinary project, um, which I think was the best thing I ever did uh, here or anywhere. Um, and this was a, a very large project that lasted a very long time. And I wanted to just sort of show you how it happened because it wasn't just me, it was me and Andrew. <laughs> this is Andrew Kelly who graduated in 2011 and he received a grant from the Nanovic Institute to work on an, an, an early novel by Victor Hugo um, as one of my mentees. And so here he is at the, in my favorite library in Paris where many of my students go to study and he's working on Victor Hugo's novel at the Bibliothèque Historique de la Ville de Paris. And, so, and I was there too that day, because that's where I study. And so later that day, we were walking around Paris, and we, went, we, hap we happened to walk in front of the Hotel de Ville, and there was this huge banner in front of it with the picture that you saw of the very thin man, and it said dignity, and it said free entrance today, and with the photographers present. So we thought, wow, that sounds cool. Let's go and see if it really is free. And, Maybe we can meet the photographers. So we did go, and it was free, and this is what it looked like. It was huge, absolutely enormous, and the photographers were present. And so Andrew and I got to talk to the five photographers that represented this kind of human rights photojournalism from five countries 
India, Macedonia, Nigeria, Mexico, and Egypt. Yes, of course, Egypt. And we, you know, with, with Andrew's uh, very ebullient personality and excitement about what this might mean to Notre Dame, he said, well, let's bring this to Notre Dame. Or in other words, why don't you bring this to Notre Dame? <laughs> and I being, you know, susceptible to youthful enthusiasm said, yeah, what a great idea. And so in the meantime, he graduated and, <laughs> <laughs> but we brought it to Notre Dame. And, and um, I want to, if, I don't know if Chuck Loving is here today or anybody from the Snight Museum, but hats off to the Snight Museum. It was just an absolute joy working with them for all the many months that it took to bring this, uh, to, get the, to get the electronic copies of the originals, to uh, put them into the right format for our Snight Museum to put it up and to get it off the ground. It was just fantastic. And in the meantime, I hired two students to work with me, um, Leah Malowitz here on, on the left, and Laura Wester, Lauren Wester. And together, we translated the uh, exhibit catalog during summer 2012, uh, 11. Yeah, 11. And um, here's a couple of colleagues who are here in the audience today. Uh, Professor Jean Dibble in art, art history, and design, and Professor Tom Kasselman in the history department who were active collaborators with me in making this event happen. And then Laura, Lauren Wester and Diana Snight from the Snight Museum. Diana Mathias, sorry, from the Snight Museum. This is in the summer when we're getting the whole thing ready to roll out. This is why we loved it so much when we first saw it. This is an example. So it's a picture from the Mexico exhibit of a little girl named Maria. And the reason that Andrea and I liked this exhibit so much is that you have her name and then you have her story. So it's not just that anonymous suffering human rights or the horrible photography that you see often in the newspapers, this gives you the real context of these people's lives. And we found that really moving. But the idea was to hook it up somehow with Rousseau to celebrate his tricentennial. So that's what we put uh, with Lauren and um, Leah, we chose quotes that we thought were appropriate from Rousseau and put them, juxtaposed them to the, uh, the work of art, works of art from the Dignity exhibit. And then with the help of the people in the Snipe Museum, we created a sister exhibit called A Person's Worth. And these are uh, examples in the, collect in the permanent collection of the Snipe Museum that reverberated or dialogued in some way with the D Dignity exhibit. So this one by um, Katha Kolowitz was very powerful as a pendant to the portrait of Maria here in terms of works of art that elicit pity in the eyes of the spectator. And then here we are. One of the, the, the most wonderful things for me was the kinds of um, community engagement I was able to get involved in here, thanks to Sarah Martin in the Snipe Museum of Art and uh, people at the Robinson Center for Learning right down here in the neighborhood. So we got to do a couple of workshops with children from the neighborhood. And they came in and they were, as you can see, they were really very wonderful, very engaged. And then they, they did their drawings. Um, a few of them drew these cute drawings here. Um, this one says, some people who barely have a place to live still stand strong. And this is obviously a, a remake of the, our poster boy for the exhibit. And um, <coughs> that was just a really fun thing to do. And here it is now in the Snipe Museum of Art making its American debut. And I was very proud of that. And here we brought over Johan Rousselo too. <laughs> He's the, the uh, photographer for the India part. Okay, so you might say, well, what's, that's all great and everything, but what does that have to do with French literature? Well, the class I taught that semester hooked it right in with French literature, and I did a, a senior seminar about humanitarian thought in, in uh, French philosophy and literature, and these are some examples of the term papers that my students wrote in French, um, and our, our class met in the Dignity exhibit for the first couple weeks. And you can see they totally got it, how to connect human rights legislation, human rights concerns through history and in literature. Okay, so my last example of experimentation and teaching has to do with working with um, my friend Jean Dibble and being inspired by her in the art department about how do we connect and how do we make success for students possible in different ways, right? Obviously, we're very invested in, in teaching them how to, how to write, all of us are very, very concerned about our students mastering the skill of good writing. 
uh, and that's important, and I always do that in every class. But starting back in around 2008, inspired by Jean, I thought, well, maybe I'll try a different way of, of allowing students to express what they've learned in my class. And we do this through what's called an altered book, where you take a hardback book, um, not a brand new one, it should be an older book, and you, it should be appropriate in some way for the topic. This one is actually Les Fleurs du Mal by Baudelaire, a beautiful work of poetry. And you alter it. As you can see, this one, she burned the pages. And she blacked out lines of poetry so they would mean something different. I mean, this is just a, 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 a genius uh, example of what a student can do. So she was altering uh, Baudelaire's poetry so it makes a comment on the execution of Louis XVI. And uh, it's this by Catherine Davis, a student who had a hard time speaking French but really found her medium in the altered book. And so this was a, a, quite a wonderful, it doesn't always work. Uh, and you have to have very clear parameters for evaluation and criteria for judging these things. But it can work wonderfully sometimes. Um, here's another example from a university seminar for first year students. This student took uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and altered it so that it would show her sources and the things that inspired her. So you have the rhyme of the ancient mariner here and the lines in Frankenstein that are inspired by that. And here is um, the word oxygen and the debate between Lavoisier and Priestley about oxygen um, that a, a very fr a first year student, a freshman, came up with this. And these were good moments for me in teaching because it, I felt like I was allowing students to express themselves and express what they'd learned in a personal way that was something, you know, it wasn't my genre, it wasn't academic writing, it was a different genre that they had made their own. And I know that they found this very powerful. And so since then, I've really enjoyed, from that Dignity exhibit, I so enjoyed working with children. So now I decided to just start teaching for children too. So for the last 18 months, I teach a class at the library downtown with a former student, Alexa Craig, and we teach altered bookmaking and story writing to children ages nine to 13, and this is our class uh, right now. And you can see they're holding their book that we made together, and so it's just a lot of fun. And I think working with people of different ages makes you a better teacher because you have some fun, and you remember that teaching should be fun. Okay, so that, I just wanted to end up with a tribute to my students. And to say that we in the French section, and I think many of us feel that our students are really special, uh, but some, since I'm up here today, I get to say why my students are special. <laughs> and we think they're really special because they have something in common with us. We share a passion for things French. Um, most of them are not native French speakers, so we, have, we share the learning of that, it took, that it took to be able to master that language in speaking and in writing. And many of them are... are, are quite ambitious and they seek out funding from the Nanavik Institute every semester and many of them receive it. So here we are, these are not all French students. This, I mean, whoops, actually here's a couple of French people, this guy and they're French people, friends of mine. <laughs> that, but you can see here's Brett Beatty and he's clearly from Notre Dame and um, having dinner with some students, some friends. And here we are again that last spring and then here again we were uh, this fall and I think some of these people are actually here in the audience today. Um, and these students all had individual research projects that they worked on. Um, this young woman worked on a famous uh, popular French song called La Mère Michel, and she, dis she, she discovered the evolution of this song from the 19th century. Uh, this young woman here worked on the opera. The, she went to the Garnier Opera, took the tour, talked about the Phantom of the Opera, and audience response, the history of audience response. And so they really come up with wonderful uh, projects that they undertake. And so I have one more slide to show the, why our students are so wonderful, that they, they work hard, they, they get to go li live in France and pick grapes <laughs> with us when we were you know, the Angers program directors. And then they do great things afterwards. Here's Stephanie, who is in law school, Damien, who is in the history department here, and Chip is an exact executive at Nestle. Here's um, Marco Sandusky, who is, I believe his mother is here today. And Marco is a lawyer. And then Bridget Brennan here as a translator. And we're all really proud of what they've become. And my last slide is simply a letter to my students to let them know that I realize I may not be their favorite teacher while they have me, but usually they like me later. <laughs> <laughs> so my letter, sorry if I'm a little tough on you sometimes, but I want you to realize that French is a skill you can master. I want you to go out and use, the, use that skill in the world 
knowing that you can speak and write French with fluency and use that language in your professional pursuits. And I want you to help other Americans understand that the, the charm that French culture and its stories hold for us and keep them alive, just like I do with Victor Hugo and Rousseau. And I want them to remember that I'm an American too. I have no secret to my success. I was born and raised in Seattle, and my mom and brother from Seattle are here today. And there's no... <laughs> but there's no secret. There's no secret to success but hard work and allowing failure to happen and embracing it. And so if I can do it, you can too. And so, au boulot. That's it. <laughs>